Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor and Carrie Brown coming at you with another Smarter Science of Slim podcast. Carrie, how are you doing this week? I'm doing awesome this week. I'm also doing awesome because I just had a sampling of like five of Carrie's sane treats. Let me, Carrie, let me see if I can get a correct summary of what I just ate. So I, I ate a, a uh, egg mini quiche sane cupcake thing. Is that what you call it? Is that what you call it? It was a broccoli <laughs> and red pepper egg cup. Ah, yes. And it was, it was splendid. That was splendid. And then I had some uh, a soup that was a color that I have I've never seen before in food, and it was spectacular. It was pretty much the color of your t-shirt. It was, it was, and what and describe that for it our listeners. It was deep purple. Deep, deep purple. But describe this the soup then. It was beaten tarragon, and I think it's the best thing I've ever made, ever. Yes, it was quite delicious and quite filling, and it was quite colorful as well. So th- three for three. And then I had some uh, cashews. They were orange and something spice. They were caramel orange spice. <laughs> and these are all sane and delicious. All sane and delicious. All sane. And then I had Carrie's version of a, a peanut butter sane mousse, which she mousified it, if that's the <laughs> word. Mine, mine was not moussey as hers is, but it was also delicious, so thank you. And then did I have anything else? Oh, and then I tried your, your porridge. Nutty porridge. Oh, the yes, the oatmeal. <laughs> yes, Carrie, so describe your sane quote unquote oatmeal. Um, everybody's very excited about that. I think that's <laughs> been my most, my singly most visited page in the history of my little food blog was the the hot and nutty oatmeal replacement that I made that everybody's getting very excited and about. And then what are the basic and and composition? It has almond meal and black seeds, some chia seeds, and some other yummy, oh, whey protein powder, nice. lots of good stuff. Yeah, and we had, uh, and then there was a, also a cranberry orange scone, which was like a, a coconut flour, almond flour. Carrie is still trying to perfect it because I'm, I keep throwing, I keep throwing sanity requirements at her, and I'm just like, oh, make it have more of this. And she's like, you can't just say, put more of that in it, it ruins the recipe, which I know intellectually, but I like to keep on her toes. So I thought it was very good, but she, being the world it's class, not good enough. Being the world class pastry chef that she is, our definitions of delicious are not the same. So, so it was all good. It was all good. So I'm very full. I'm very, I'm very full of sanity and ready to talk about some smarter science of slim at frequently asked questions this week. All right. So question number one, which. Uh, Neither Carrie or I can necessarily speak to from experience, but we can speak to from a uh, science perspective. It has to do with sane eating in children, and that's specifically, is sane eating the same for children as it is for adults? So we are not necessarily qualified to tell you how to get your kids to eat sane food because neither Carrie or I have kids, but we can tell you some important things about if you do or if you are interested in, in helping your kids to be sane, uh, whether or not that's a good idea, which, which I'll spoil the surprise, it is, and, and why. Okay. Cool. All right. So there's basically for the question of is sane eating the same for children and, and adults, the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that the same foods that are satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient for adults – are the same for children. It's not as if non-starchy vegetables are healthy for adults and not healthy for children. They're equally healthy for all people, no matter their age. Same thing applies with nutrient-dense protein. Same thing applies with uh, applies to whole food natural fats. Everything that makes sane eating important for adults makes it even more important for children. And that's why I say no. Sane eating isn't actually the same for children and adults because it's more important for children than it is for adults for four reasons. One, children require more nutrition than adults. And as we know, a sane lifestyle is simply focused on eating the most nutritious food available to us. 
Two, children are more susceptible to food-related behavior problems. So, you know, being bouncing off the walls and then being cranky and even sometimes some uh, ADHD issues are really just nutrition-related. And then third, fat cells never go away. And we'll talk more about this in a moment, but if a child gains uh, excess body fat, that's a battle that they're going to have to fight against for the rest of their life, which is which is truly sad. And number four is that children form habits that affect them for the rest of their lives. So anything we can do to help our children understand the science and understand the actual way to eat for health, as well as being delicious simultaneously, that's going to benefit them for 80 or 100 years, hopefully. So it's all good. I have a cute little story. Uh, one of my girlfriends has a, a little girl who just turned one. And um, mom has been hugely frustrated that um, the, her little girl wouldn't would just was not interested in breakfast. She just wouldn't eat breakfast until one day her mother decided to make my strawberry chia seed pudding. Oh, yeah. And now every morning, that's <laughs> all it. this little girl wants is she wants the strawberry chia seed or blueberry, whatever berries her mom yeah. makes it with her. And she absolutely loves it. And it's the only thing she will eat for breakfast. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And she's also a big fan of those egg cups, that one yeah. I just made you for lunch. She's oh, a huge, wow. huge fan of those. And and so actually when mum threw her her first birthday party the other week, apart from the, the actual cake, everything else at this one-year-old's party was sane. That's food. awesome. That's really, really cool. So I don't, And I throw that in there because I don't want, parents to automatically think wow it's healthy i'm gonna have i'm struggling going to struggle oh, yeah. to get them to eat it that has not been the case yeah and 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 what a lot of people find i mean a lot of my my friends are have very very young children and children are not necessarily born wanting candy bars uh it's sort of a hyper stimulation uh, when you give a child these processed foods it a bit like giving them crack. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to use that sort of morbid analogy, but these foods are literally engineered to make humans' brains go crazy with releases of things like dopamine. And if you give a child these foods, they don't. They're just like, what? <laughs> like it's like you give a kid, a kid caffeine, doesn't really know what to do with it. Uh, however, uh, you know, kids when they're not subjected to these kinds of foods find foods that everyone else finds delicious to be just as delicious as everyone else finds them. So it's very, just like it's possible to eat sanely and to really enjoy food as Carrie just showed me with the food she gave me. Uh, we can, we can definitely have uh, children enjoying food uh, and have it be sane at the same time. So let's dig into detail on, and I don't want to spend the whole podcast because I know not all of our listeners have, have young children, but I do want to provide some, some useful information here. So one, we talked about children need more nutrition than adults. And we all know this. Uh, for example, let's look at like the youngest, quote unquote, uh, children possible. When, when a child is actually developing in utero, we as a culture globally understand that, that that developing child needs very precise nutrition or else their development halts. I personally am very saddened that that mindset seems to go away as soon as the child leaves uh, the uterine environment. You know, it all ties back to what we were talking about on the last podcast, which is the why. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, people can do the right thing if they have a big enough why. Yeah. And a child growing within you yeah, yeah. is a big enough why. Well, I'm hoping that's a great point. I'm hoping this podcast can maybe help further that why, because uh, just just because the child is not growing with it, like my, the point I'm trying to make is there's nine months, you know, from from conception to nine months, the child is developing. The child continues to develop once it leaves the womb for like 18 years. So it's it's not as if so we 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 care deeply about the nutrition that child receives from zero to nine months. And I would urge us to be, at this point, even half as concerned with the nutrition that child receives for the next 18 years of development, because they're developing literally just as much. And water, fiber, protein-rich, sane foods contain more nutrition per calorie than any other food on the planet. That's that's the N, insane. So 
ensuring they have an abundance of those foods is really good for them. And then also related our kids, you know, being very active, they often need quite a few calories. Oftentimes we're told the scientifically garbage statement that the only way to do this is to give kids sugar and starch. And that's absolutely not true. If you need to give anyone, child or adult, extra calories, the best way to do that is via sane sources of fat. So cocoa, coconut, avocado, flax seeds, chia seeds, nuts nut butters. If you're a distance athlete, if you're a growing child and you need abundant energy, you can do that healthfully and simply using these whole food natural fats we just talked about. There's absolutely no need to supplement your diet with starches and sweets. Absolutely no need. So that's all good. The second point is that children are more susceptible to food-related behavior problems. This one we can, we can kind of skip over because we all know if we stuff our kids full of uh, aggressive foods like sugars and starches, they flip out and then they crash. And then we have to deal with the consequences of that. So if we stick with unaggressive nutrient dense proteins, non-starchy vegetables and whole food fats, we'll find that oftentimes a lot of uh, children that may otherwise be considered problem children are, are actually not. They're just, you know, if you, if you put kerosene in a car's gas tank, you might think that's a problem car, it's not. It's just being given the wrong fuel. The same thing applies to a lot of our little You have ones. the best analogies. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> it. So, and, and actually, there's a lot of here, a lot of really cool stories about even things like autism uh, being dramatically helped with diets, like Nutrition. the, the yeah. GAPS diet. And even what, um, what is the, I think, epilepsy and, and very low carbohydrate diets. Like they're now using very, very, very low carbohydrate diets in some cases to put epilepsy in complete remission. Like very interesting because the body stops running primarily on glucose and starts running on the derivatives from fat metabolism, which is uh, ketones. Anyway, so it changes the way the body fuels itself, changes the way the body runs, good stuff. What I think potentially, so nutrition is obviously very important. Kids being able to control themselves is, is, is very important. But the one that really gets me and, and Carrie, to your point earlier about understanding the why, like, you know, it's probably not a good idea to take drugs while you're pregnant because, you know, then this child could be born with a challenges for the rest of its life. Okay. I don't, I don't mean to like make this sound too severe, but I'm just going to communicate the scientific fact. It is a fact that once we develop a fat cell, it does not go away. It can become shrunk, but it's always there. This is why once you gain fat, it is harder to stay lean for the rest of your life because you're predisposed to storing that fat. So if you're a child that has no control over what you eat and are simply eating what you're given, and that causes you to develop new fat cells, you now, for the next 70 to 100 years, are going to have to struggle with your weight forever. It's not something that you can just, oh, just go exercise more. Like you literally are now carrying this backpack of being predisposed to fat gain forever. And we, you know, we avoid doing certain things while the child's developing in utero because it would break our hearts to put our kids in a position where they're going to have to struggle against something for the rest of their life. If our children are gaining excess fat, we are, we are putting them in a position, and I, and I don't mean to like be too sad about this, it's just true that they're going to have to struggle with for the rest of their life. Because they've literally got more fat cells than, than other people. And they literally can do nothing to get rid of them. It's not like they can exercise more and the fat cells will go away. The fat so cells may we, shrink. We can shrink them, but they're still always going to have more. So they, yeah. There's just that propensity, it. right? Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> it's just... That's very yeah. sad. It's, it's very sad. So that's why if you need a compelling why, like I realize... Again, I have no kids, so it's hard for me to talk about some of these things. But I realize, it, it, you know, we live in a society where it makes it very food pr manufacturers make it very easy to take these processed garbage things and just you know throw them in the kids' lunch pail and go gurt and all these just and kids see the advertisements on TV, so it's what they're asking for. But you know, just like we try to send our kids to good schools because we know that you know having a good education will benefit them for the rest of their life. What happens to our children in terms of their health in their childhood will affect them throughout their life 
as profoundly, if not more profoundly, than their education. I mean, the, the number of hardships that overweight individuals face in our culture in terms of discrimination, in terms of social ostracism, in terms of self-esteem issues, in terms of just freeing your kids of that burden, I think is one of the most profound gifts you can give to them. And I think, I don't think I know they'll appreciate that when they get older. Right. So, right. And then, and then, yeah, that really has to do with number four, which is again, that the habits our uh, kids form when they're kids is going to affect them for the rest of their life. And the one point I'll call out here is there are people who are somewhat naturally thin and because they're naturally thin, they don't worry about their eating habits as they grow up. And you, you see this a lot in people who, once they go to college or once they hit 30, if they don't develop good eating habits, they may be able to slide by based on their youth until they hit 25 or 30 and then those suboptimal eating habits, Carrie, I think you're an example uh, of I'm this. I'm a perfect example Just, of this. Just, you know, it's great. I can slide by on my magic youth metabolism. But then when 30 hits, whoop. Yeah. Bet, I bet you wish, you, you know, you learned how to eat sanely before then. Yeah. I feel very lucky because I, of course, unintentionally grew up in a, you know, pretty sane household. My mother, we had a lot of vegetables. My father grew everything. We did not eat junk food we didn't have potato chips and all of that stuff except once a year we didn't have candy except once a year it's uh, we did have bread and cakes but they were all things that my mother made from scratch at home mm -hmm. were never anything so i i was lucky in that i i had that kind of base mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you're right i didn't think about it until suddenly I woke up and went, that is not my body. What the hell happened? Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and now, well, everybody knows the story now, but I am one of those naturally thin people that, that just thought it was going to be like that forever and then woke up and went, oh. <laughs> yeah, eventually bad eating habits will. And there's plenty of thin people that have diabetes and there's plenty of thin people that have heart attacks. And just, you know, being thin doesn't necessarily mean we're healthy either. Right. So that's that's also very important. So. All right, so that's a very common question. So to summarize, is saying eating the same for children as it is for adults? Yes and no. Yes, the exact same things we're telling you to eat as an adult are the same things your kid should be eating. No, in the sense that technically, as much effort as you're putting into sanity, I would recommend doubling that if you have kids because it's going to help them even more than it's going to help you. It's going to set them up for, for uh, having an optimal life for the rest of their lives in a way that is just so profound. So... That's good stuff. And I do uh, just one last thing about what to feed them. I, I do think about, even though I don't have children either, I do think about when I'm creating these recipes, mm -hmm. I try and create them with whole families in mind, yeah. i.e. there's a lot of the, the dishes where I've hidden vegetables or where they're not necessarily would children would think that they actually had were eating vegetables. So I hope that I've I've, I can help you make it easier because the recipes have, have more vegetables in them than your kids have any idea they're eating. Absolutely. And again, with everything else, folks, don't don't beat yourself up if you can't be perfect. People sometimes, the cynics out there say to me, well, Jonathan, when you have kids, are you not going to let them trick or treat? Of course I'm going to let them trick or treat because it's a treat. We can all have treats. We can, Even as adults, we can all have treats. The point is, though, I, I, I will not feed my children sugar saturated cereal for breakfast, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, and then a dinner of pasta and cookies. Like I, I, I won't. So, but, but uh, if we don't know any better, then, then it's really hard to keep our kids free from that. So it's not about perfection. Treats are fine. If they're going to a birthday party, of course, that's a party. It's a celebration. The idea is what are we doing day in and day out? Yeah. So next big question we get asked is, how does the smarter science of slim or sane eating compare to traditional diets like Adkins, Weight Watchers, or let's say paleo? So the first thing I'll mention is that Adkins, Weight Watchers, and paleo are all diets, meaning they only deal with how you eat. We know the smarter science of slim deals with both how we eat and how we exercise. So that's one difference right off the bat is traditional diets have nothing to do with exercise. So we, we have a complete lifestyle here, and that's really important because it all works together <clears throat> to fix our metabolism. So that's right. great. It's a complete reframe of how we think about food and exercise. But let's step through these. So first, Adkins. 
let's abstract this and say just low carb in general. So there's quite a few similarities between a low carbohydrate diet and a sane way of eating, but let's quickly define a low carbohydrate diet. Individuals who are on low carbohydrate diets, there's often three phases. There's like an induction phase, there's a phase two, I don't know what it's called, and then there's a maintenance phase. And most people, when they think of low carb diets, are thinking of the induction phase. And an induction phase of a low carb diet is anywhere from 20 grams Basically, you, you can not exceed 20 grams of carbohydrate in a day, or some cases it's 50 grams of carbohydrate in a day. So from that's any source. From any source. So that, that sometimes even requires restriction of like no fruits at all, only certain kinds of vegetables, and you have to go out of your way to eat fat because otherwise you have no source of calories. So you'll be eating almost 70% of your calories from fat. So you're eating things like butter and bacon and full fat, everything, because you just, you need energy. Right. So there's, uh, and, but however, if you are on like the Atkins maintenance phase, it's actually much similar. I mean, it's actually very similar to a sane way of eating because it just says, don't eat starch, don't eat sweets, enjoy, uh, non-starchy vegetables, enjoy low sugar fruits, enjoy low sugar dairy products, enjoy nutrient dense meats and whole foods fats. A The maintenance phase of the Atkins diet allows generally, I think it's somewhere between 80 and 120 grams of carbohydrates per day. But you can get them from anywhere. But no, no. I mean, it's, it's still, uh, that's a good point. I mean, uh, Ish. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in the Adkins diet, but the general gist is that the Adkins maintenance phase is is quite similar to a sane lifestyle. Sane lifestyle is going to focus a little more, a little bit more on food quality, meaning it is going to say it's not just that you eat about 120 or 75 grams of carbohydrate per day. It's that those are coming from right. non-starchy vegetables. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. But I think I think it's more macronutrient focused. Not I'm not a huge expert in it, but it is it's quite similar. So, and actually the same thing applies to paleo. A paleo type diet is very similar to a sane way of eating. The only, so the only real big difference between Adkins and a sane way of eating is in some ways an Adkins diet will say you should go out of your way to eat a full fat cut of meat. Like if you have the choice between eating a, a um, fatty steak and a lean steak, you should go with the fatty steak because you're intentionally restricting carbohydrate so you eat more fat in its place. With the sane lifestyle, you could do that. You could do a lower carb sane lifestyle, or you could do a higher carb sane lifestyle, in which case you would want to take the leaner choice of meat. Paleo is somewhat similar, where paleo is generally focused on eating food in the most natural state possible. So for example, chicken with the skin on is more quote unquote natural than chicken with the skin off. So you'd eat chicken with the skin on. Again, that's and 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 if you say to someone in the paleo community, I eat egg whites, they would spit in your face. No, I'm just kidding. They would spit in your face, but it doesn't make them happy because they're like, well, why wouldn't you eat the whole egg? And I get criticized for this all the time. And it's not about saying that whole eggs are bad or that chicken skin is bad. It's about saying, what are your goals? If your goal is to eat food like it's found in nature, then of course eat it like it's found in nature. If your goal is to eat water, fiber, and protein rich foods, egg whites have more protein are 91% protein, a whole egg is only 35% protein because the yolk is predominantly fat. So is a paleo lifestyle like a sane lifestyle? Yes, they're 90% similar. The question is just, do you eat more carbohydrate or do you eat more fat? And if you eat more fat, you end up eating things like whole eggs and chicken with the skin on. If you eat more carbohydrate, you end up eating things like egg whites and chicken with the skin off because you're getting more more calories and carbohydrates. Does, maybe you don't know this. Um, do, do paleo people eat dairy? That's a good question. So fundamental, there's three, to my understanding, there's three fundamental pillars to a paleo lifestyle. One is no grain. The other is no sugar. The other is no seed oils or processed oils. Dairy, so if you're like really paleo, no, you don't do any dairy because you don't just find dairy in nature. You have to do something with it. You also don't do like legumes or beans potentially because paleo is also focused on this, this idea of anti-nutrients. So there are some foods which are thought to block the absorption of other nutrients. So you'd avoid things like tomatoes and eggplants. I mean, it, there's, there's like basic paleo, paleo 101, which is just avoid. It, it's Paleo 101 is essentially a sane lifestyle. It's mm -hmm. avoid refined grain, avoid grains, sweeteners, and processed seed oils, mm -hmm. which is essentially a sane lifestyle. Right. Sane lifestyle is going to say more 
non-starchy vegetables. Like you need to go bananas with non-starchy vegetables. But by and large, 99% the same. Paleo lifestyle is awesome. On the more extreme end of the spectrum, a paleo lifestyle is a very restrictive lifestyle, which can come, can be essentially just non-starchy vegetables, fruits, meats, and seafood, and nothing else. And for a lot of people, that works really, really well. And a if I had to just, I mean, I personally, my research has shown that low carbohydrate diets are profoundly beneficial for a lot of people. They it's shown that paleo diet is profoundly beneficial for a lot of people. So I think there's ways to do low carb sane. Like I think you could do the Atkins diet just saying, I'm gonna try to, when I'm eating low carb, I'm gonna try to eat the most satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient foods possible. Same thing with paleo. I'm gonna try to do the same thing with paleo and that works just fine. So those get a thumbs up for me. They're very sane. They're very supported by science. The other class of popular diets is not at all supported by me and not at all supported by science. And those are things like Weight Watchers or any sort of calorie counting program, such as Jenny Craig, or such as these mail order programs where you get all your meals in the mail. And it's, it's fundamentally about portion control. These diets are fundamentally predicated on the idea that we need to manually regulate the amount of calories we eat and the amount of calories we burn off. And that's just not the way our body works. You can, you can you know, stretch a rubber band as much as you'd like, but eventually that rubber band is going to snap back. When you eat less of just a traditional diet, you're essentially stretching your metabolic rubber band, and as soon as you stop doing that, you're going to snap back. So unless you plan on being on Weight Watchers for the rest of your life, it's not going to work. Unless you plan on eating a, a, a six-inch Subway sub twice a day for the rest of your life, you're going to end up worse off because those programs – do not seek to heal your body. They seek to override and fight against your body. And we always lose battles against our bodies. Whereas a thing like Adkins, the goal of Adkins is to help your body run off of fat rather than running off of carbohydrate. The goal of paleo is really just to, to enable your body to eat the foods it was designed to eat. That's why those diets work they transform the way your body works. That's also why sanity works. They change your body. Whereas things like these calorie counting programs, they just fight against your body and they don't work. I've often thought that the success of Weight Watchers, even before I met you and learned all this stuff, that the, the, what made Weight Watchers work for people for whom it does work is the uh, public accountability. Absolutely. That That's, yeah. you know, it's having to... You know, you, you, your goal's out there, it's all out there, and you have to show up every week, and you had better be lighter than you were last yeah. week. So, you know, there is some goodness there. Absolutely. It's just not, I think it's more in the, the emotional than it is the actual doing anything healthy for your body. It's a great point. Like weight, and Weight Watchers, to their credit, I don't know if it's Weight Watchers or one of the other programs, but they are changing. Like, they're starting to, it used to just be, I'm exaggerating, but it's it's like eat 1,200 calories a day from whatever. I don't care. You just can't exceed 1,200 calories per day. You can eat 1,200 calories a Twinkie, and, and at the support group, they're like, yay, you met your goal. That's very much changing. They're very much moving towards food quality. And, but you're exactly right. In terms of the social support, which we've talked about in previous podcasts, they nail that. And I, I, I only hope that soon they will catch up to the science, and soon they'll be able to combine that support with actual science and i can only imagine that how much more success people will have then yeah so you mentioned the twinkie oh the twinkie diet no have you, you heard mentioned about this the oh. twinkie and i just it's interesting that you mentioned the twinkie because the twinkie died last week yeah yeah they went out of business didn't they <laughs> that's awesome and um i'm i have to say i'm very sad that people are going to be losing their jobs but the twinkie oh. was not making us healthy people yeah, um, well yeah i mean <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people are employed trafficking drugs too. I mean, I don't, I'd offend some people, but there's, there's some things. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of industries that employ people. Not sure that that is a good enough reason to keep those industries around, but uh. anyway, but yeah, so glad to see them go and actually carry the, the last question. Let's cover this week actually has to do with Twinkies. Uh, this is not current news. Maybe a year or two ago, there was this college professor who went on the quote-unquote Twinkie diet and lost 27 pounds. 
And what he was trying to illustrate was how you can eat whatever you want. And as long as you create a caloric deficit, you're going to lose weight. Well, a couple things to talk about here. So I don't think anyone's debating. And we've never said that if you eat a thousand calories a day, that you're not going to lose weight. Actually, what we've said is you are going to lose weight. You're going to become dehydrated. You're going to burn off a bunch of muscle tissue. And then you are going to burn off some fat until your body slows down enough to deal with that. And then you're going to maintain that new degraded version of yourself until you stop eating a thousand calories a day. And then you're going to experience fat super accumulation and be worse off than you ever were before. So the question is not, is the, is a Twinkie diet effective? Anything you could just stop eating. Like the starvation diet is effective too. I mean, ask anyone who's, who's been through a famine, they lose weight. <laughs> the question again, though, is if, 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 Weight loss and destroying our health is a valid goal, and I would argue that it's not. So is the Twinkie diet effective? No. It, it destroys your health, and it, it may make you burn muscle and slow down your metabolism, but you know, you could cut off your leg and you'd lose weight too, but you don't see anyone. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe next year there'll be the cut off your leg <laughs> diet. Who knows? I lost 30 pounds in five minutes. All it took was this hacksaw. <laughs> On that note, so those are our... Frequently. Not that you have strong feelings about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> that was our our uh, our fearly asked questions for this week. I'm not sure I can top that. And I, I think I've sort of left the farm a little bit. I think it's Carrie's delicious food has has changed. It has changed the way my brain is working. It was working. that beet. It was that beet. I have never beet eaten soup. beets in tarragon before. I think. I think you laced that with something. Spinach. <laughs> there you go. Hid some spinach in there. Well, Carrie, do you have any final words? Uh, keep asking the questions. Let us know how we can help. Absolutely. Jonathan Baylor, Carrie Brown, Living the Smarter Science of Slim. Have a great week. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content and just one last thing before you go if you wouldn't mind heading over to itunes and up onto amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to facebook and liking us we would hugely appreciate it 